I'm Gary Cook, so I'm the executive director here, and I do on the side a little adjunct teaching at uh, a little seminary up north in Dallas. Um, and uh, I started thinking about this probably about a year ago. Um, I, in classes I teach, there's um, er, there are theology classes, and each one focuses on a central doctrine. And one of the things the students have to do by the end of the course is they have to write kind of their statement of what that doctrine is in you know simple language, non-technical. Then they have to write an, uh, a detailed explanation of it. And then the final part is called practical implications, which, me, which is how does this doctrine apply to your ministry? And so I really emphasize that with the students as I teach. I tell them up front, yeah, I'm gonna grade all that, but what I really care about is what you think about this in relation to, to your ministry. And then last fall, I heard a sermon and uh, the pastor used the term sacred stewardship in it. And that really rung with me. And so um, I started thinking about that as I, as I taught different things. And then early this summer, I got to go to Uganda. And Uganda, we went, to, we went to three different locations and we were teaching pastors at each of those locations. And so what I talked to them about is their calling and how their calling to be a pastor is a sacred stewardship, handed down from generation to generation to right there in Inganga, to right there in Kapala, uh, in the places that we were at. And so uh, I've been really thinking about this for a long time, and then I wanted to, because uh, uh, Pastor J Jason and Pastor Daniel asked me to teach this fall, I wanted to do that here for the church. So. Yes, Sadie, I'm really going to try and keep the cookies as much on the lower shelf as I can because I want this to be relatable, understandable for you. And I'll explain why that's important in just a minute. But tonight's going to be all about where we're going. Where we're going to go through the, I think we're, we've got 15 weeks. So where we're going, I just want to give you a high-level overview of where we're headed with this. So what is stewardship? Let's start with that basic definition. Well, stewardship means that you were trusted with something. Um, a delegated responsibility to manage um, for someone else. That's kind of a Webster's definition, but I actually got that out of the dictionary in the back of my New American Standard Bible. So a delegated responsibility to manage for another. And we see that in the Old Testament, and we see that in the New Testament, the parable that Jesus gives about the talents that are given to three different individuals, and they're a steward those because he comes back, the manager comes back, what have you done with what I gave you? So I want you to think for a minute. What are some things that, that people are entrusted to steward? They aren't spiritual, but just what are some things that people are entrusted to steward, to take care of? Children. Children. Ding, 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 that's number one on the list. <laughs> uh, you're, you've got a responsibility for the children that God's given you to uh, take care of them. If you're a parent, that's a responsibility for ever, it seems like. Um, if you're a grandparent, you can hand them back. <laughs> if you're a friend, you can babysit them. But, but children, big responsibility, right? What are your expectations with children as you're stewarding them? <laughs> Safe, yeah. Uh, but you have, you know, you have you have desires for them and how they grow, and there's there's things that you want them to to do, um, and uh, there's rules of the house. There's things you're doing to kind of teach them. Eventually, you want them to become adults and be functioning adults out in the world. Um, and it's exciting to watch when that turns out well. Difficult when it doesn't turn out so well, right? What else? Yeah. Steward it and keep it going. Yep, and that gets handed on from one generation to the next. If that happens, it doesn't always happen that way, but if it does, there's an expectation you're going to take care of it. And maybe even it'll be better when you're done than it was when you got it handed down to you, right? What else? You can manage someone's money. You want to 
Money? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, either money that you, re- you know, that you receive because the Lord provides for you or an inheritance that you might get from someone. Yeah, money. That's, that's typical, right? And that was kind of what happened with those three stewards, right? They're given a talent, a talent, they're talent, a different number, and they're measured by how they, re- how they responsibly handled those talents that they were given. So you have children, family business, inheritance. Resources. What's that? Resources. Yeah. Our natural resources, human resources, what have you. Yeah. Keepsakes, um, a talent or a skill that you receive. Um, sitting in here, it's probably true. <laughs> yeah. And. I was just going to say this. <laughs> what's that? My mother-in-law's cookie recipe. <laughs> yes. So I brought with you a cookie recipe, or with me, a cookie recipe that was handed down in Karen's family. So uh, this is for... Um, Spritz butter cookies. Yeah, butter cookies. And by the way, um, one of our family traditions, we did it, did we do it this last year? I know we did it before. But we used to go, so on Christmas, there's a whole series of different cookies that, that uh, Karen makes, recipes that were handed down, right? And then uh, we like to, of course, eat them. And then we like to also make a plate of them and take them around to different families. We just, every year, would kind of figure out, okay, who do we want to take these to? But the butter cookies are on that, and they're incredible. So here's the recipe here. Um, So Karen got this from her parents, and her father uh, got them through his grandmother, who got them from a grandmother back in Germany, so these have been around for generations, and our daughter has this too. So it's kind of a legacy that's been passed down. Um, and I noticed you didn't run us off any copies. What's that? So, so, so this is a legacy being held securely in the family. We have lost the original index card, yeah. but we have copies of it in our hands. If you want a copy, I made one this afternoon. <laughs> You're welcome to take that with you. I, I made that copy because I got to be careful with the real one because it's, yeah. it's a little frail. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, uh, so stewardship, uh, recognize that you're responsible for maintenance of what you are given to take care of and for continuity. Expectation is you'll be able to take care of it and then pass it along because guess what? Uh, The steward doesn't last forever. If you've been entrusted with something valuable, you recognize it's valuable, right? You can't sit it, sit still and just let it, you know, let it just sit there. Um, You can't be distracted to not pay attention to it if it needs care. You can't bury it like the steward did in the parable. Uh, You can't lose it. You can't let it go to the grave with you. It's intended to be, you're entrusted with its care. You're entrusted with its use. You're entrusted with passing it on to the next one. And here's an example of that from the Proverbs. This is Proverbs 24, 30 through 34. And this is a good picture of poor stewardship. Proverbs written in the Old Testament Remember in the Old Testament, when God brought them into the land and Joshua worked to make sure the land was apportioned to the different tribes and different peoples. So here's this proverb that describes someone who had an inheritance from that time who had not cared for it well, hadn't stewarded it well. Listen to this. This is really sad. I passed by the field of the lazy one and by the vineyard of a person lacking sense. That part really troubles me personally. Because when I was a, when I was a, a young boy, my father would always say, you don't have any common sense. You don't have a lick of common sense. You don't have any common sense. It troubled me for a while. What does that mean? How do I get that? <laughs> um, Let's pick a different translation. It might be a little better. <laughs> that may help. And behold, it was completely overgrown with weeds, this land. Its surface was covered with weeds, and its stone wall 
that which would keep predators out, was broken down. When I saw it, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then your poverty will come like a drifter and your need like an armed man. Suddenly you've lost what, was, what you were entrusted to take care of and it's gone. That's really sad. My, uh, my parents both grew, on far, grew up on farms in East Tennessee. And uh, when, uh, when we were kids, my father's dad had already retired from farming. My mom's dad, my grandfather Gibson, was still farming. And we'd go there just about every summer. We'd go visit both grand and grandparents. They lived in the same small town in Tennessee, Greenville, Tennessee. We'd go to my, we, I love going to the farm. I mean, I like going to my, my grandfather Cook's house, but I love going to the farm because we got to, um, just run around the farm. We get to help out with chores. I have a really story I don't want to tell about me trying to milk a cow. I don't want to tell that story. It's awful. Um, but we would, on the way, I would notice we would see these farm, uh, we'd see these farms and barns and houses that were just, they'd gone to waste. Um, and it was, you know, I, I thought about that later in life. I didn't pay too much attention when I was a kid, but just, oh my gosh. There's my grandfather Gibson's farm thriving. And there's a farm that must have been thriving at one time, but it's just broke, got a broken down house, a broken down barn, nothing happening there. The broken down farms. So part of stewardship is not just stewarding it while you're here, but it's preparing to pass down the baton because a steward is not gonna live forever and you're, you're entrusted with it, and you're also entrusted to have it in good condition when it's ready to be passed on. The question for the steward becomes, who's gonna take the plow next? And that's one thing I talked to these pastors about. I said, be thinking now, for these Ugandan pastors, be thinking now, who's next to step in when it's your time? Um, so you look now, and you prep them now, to be the next steward. So part of, part of faithful stewardship is thinking about how to pass that down to the next generation. Isn't that what we're trying to do here at, at uh, First Baptist Bernie? We care so much about the next generation. You care about the children in your home and that they will come to faith in the Lord and that you wanna raise them to know the Lord and have a living relationship with the Lord. Uh, we care about that with everyone from, from uh, young adults all the way down to infants, right? You're prepping them because they have a stewardship. And guess what? The stewardship is not just the pastors. It's every single one of us. And that's what this, this course is all about. Here's uh, Paul exercising what I just talked about. Um, what is sacred stewardship? Not just stewardship, but sacred stewardship. It's trusted with the truths of the Christian faith. That's what we're going to focus on for these next weeks. And here's Paul writing to Timothy. This is 1 Timothy 6.20. And this is the verse that really caught my attention when I was thinking about what sacred truth is about was this verse. Oh, Timothy. So Paul knows his time is just about over. And he's put Timothy in Ephesus to lead that church. And he's written this letter to Timothy. It's called a pastoral epistle because it's great for pastors to read. Um, o Timothy, protect what has been entrusted to you. He's got a responsibility in that church. Everything up to this point leads to him being careful with the word of God, him being aware of those who, who will fall away, him being aware of wrong teaching, and and. Paul giving him kind of final instructions in this letter and the next one, final instructions about how to take care of what he's been entrusted with. He's been entrusted with that church. He's been entrusted with the word of God. He's been entrusted with being able to discern truth from error. Avoid profane, worldly, empty chatter and the absurdities opposing arguments of so-called knowledge. You read the beginning of the letter, it talks about 
ah, these people are just caught up in all these genealogies and myths and things like that. They're not focused on the true word of God. And they're not focused on the gospel. Which some have professed and therefore have gone away astray from the faith. And remember when, when uh, the, the passage that uh, Pastor Jason just went through on Sunday uh, from Acts, when he's talking to the elders from Ephesus, and he warns them about the wolves that will come in and, and destroy the flock. Well, that's the same thing that t- uh, Paul is warning Timothy about in these letters too. People want to hear what tickles their ears. They'll want to hear things that really aren't true, but they believe that those are better for them. So Paul's warning Timothy, protect, steward, take care of. I'm going to be gone, and I'm not going to be around to help you. But I've taught you well. Remember everything that I taught you. At the end tonight, I want to give you a passage that talks about someone that had good stewardship in their home that influenced Timothy before he met Paul. So that's the big idea. And it's to recognize that we collectively, so your pastors, your teachers, your fellow members, and you, each one of us, have a great responsibility. We have a responsibility to protect that which has been entrusted to us in this day. So think about it. From the time that Jesus ascended, right before he leaves, he tells his apostles, you know, Acts 1.8, I'm leaving um, and you wait for the Holy Spirit to come because you're going to be my witnesses. He was entrusting those 11 disciples and the others with what they had seen about him, what they had heard from him, the truth of the gospel, who he was. I'm so amazed when I read John's gospel because at the beginning of John's gospel, John describes who Jesus is. And it's a beautiful description of of, uh, God the Son in human flesh. It's beautiful. And I think about the moment where John realized that about Jesus. But he wrote that gospel doing exactly what Jesus desired for his disciples so that anyone who reads it will know that he's the Son of God and by knowing, believe, and have life in his name. Right? So from his ascension, where he gave it to the disciples, all the way down to right now, here we are in 2023, right here in Bernie, Texas, we've been handed that same baton that Jesus gave to his disciples, that he gave to Paul, that Paul gave to Timothy, that Timothy passed on all the way down to today. We have that same responsibility to steward the truth of God's word, the true gospel, the truth about who God is, to steward that and prepare the next generation along the way. We can't prepare them if if we don't know it, right? So that's kind of the big picture of where we're going. We are here. This is the big tree of the church, (laughs) Uh, the big tree of the historical church. So we're here in 2023, evangelical tradition, First Baptist Bernie, right there in the heart of evangelicalism. That's, That's the present tradition. And you see all these little branches down the tree, and we'll go through some of them along the way through this, this thing, because I can't help but get back into history, because that helps, you, that helps us to resonate with, yeah, this is what the church has always believed. Oh, this is where the church went a little, little weird. Uh, and we're going to go through that uh, throughout the next several weeks. From here, Jerusalem. So when, when, uh, when, uh, when Peter uh, sp- spoke in the day of Pentecost in the temple, the first time that that publicly uh, the gospel is proclaimed uh, after Christ ascended. That's probably around the date of 30 or 31 AD. So think about that. Nearly 2,000 years, right? That the gospel is still being proclaimed. That what the disciples then knew and were taught and were learning by the Holy Spirit Right? 
and by the teaching of the apostles. Still being taught today. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible? There are things that just have not changed about the Christian faith. Have not changed. They're true in God's word. Um, and the church has labored to pass them on, to protect them, to guard them, just like Paul was telling Timothy. You heard that in Jason's sermon Sunday. You heard him talk about that in his sermon. And you heard him say, hey, if you find me saying something that you got to tell me, you got to tell the pastors, right? Which means we have to become, uh, have to have to understand the truths of our faith better and better. And there's great reasons for that beyond just being able to go, okay, hold on, Jason. There's better reasons than that. But if it happens. So here's five, five uh, different areas of church history, just a little timeline. It's a big picture timeline. You've got the ancient church. So this is right after the apostles, uh, 100 to 500. A lot happening during that time. Mostly the church, um, at least most visibly, you see them refuting false teachings. Paul warned about it. John warned about it in his letters. Um, and it happened. False teachings crept in, and the church had to address those. And they had to be able to articulate the Christian faith in a way that everyone could understand, and they could defend it from Scripture. And back in that day, and we'll talk about this later, but that's when um, confessions and creeds were formed. Uh, like the Nicene Creed, like the Apostles' Creed, like the Creed of Constantinople, um, like the, uh, the Creed of Chalcedon. And those were written so that each church would have a confession that was true about God the Father, true about God the Son, true about the Holy Spirit, and that it could be taught because there were false teachings that people were being drawn to. Oh, that sounds reasonable. We're going to see a couple of those. But the ancient church was doing that. The medieval church, you have a lot of focus on um, in monasteries. You have, um, uh, you have bishops that are teaching um, logic and rhetoric. So you have these proofs of the existence of God, proofs of the incarnation, things like that. A lot of that happening. Um, and the development of the sacramental system. We'll talk about that later. Reformation. The Protestant Reformation, the, the kind of answer to what they saw had gone wrong with uh, not only the practice of the church, but even the gospel itself, and trying to get back to that. The modern period, uh, so you have, well, science, is, science triumphs, and so uh, supernatural things, like it talks about in the scripture, those really don't happen. There's scientific explanations for everything. Or... That was just a faith written by, you know, by um, unintelligent people to kind of guard and protect what they believe. Not really true. Things like that were going on. Evolution. Lots of things. And then we have the present day. But all throughout this, all throughout this time, with all these changes in culture, all these changes in philosophy, all these different things that happened, the one thing that was consistent is each generation of churches were handing down the baton. They were working and laboring to protect the truth of the gospel, the truth of scriptures, the truth about Christ, the truth about God the Father. Um, and they saw it as important to do that. They saw that as necessary. And not just for those who were leading the churches, but they saw it important to teach their people that so that they'd be able to understand the truth of the gospel, the truth about who God is. The truth about Christ. So I'm going to just mention three things real quick. Scriptures and the rule of truth. Three S's I'll go through real quick. And then we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper. Scriptures and the rule of truth. The rule of truth was um, this faithfulness or fidelity to the apostolic teaching. Because not only do you have the scriptures, but at least the early church had remembrances of what the apostles taught. And they would reflect back on, what did the apostles say when they came and taught us? I'll tell you about a guy that could really trace that himself in just a minute. So fidelity to the truth of the scriptures 
and to the apostolic teaching. We believe this because it's in the Bible, but guess what? False teachers were saying, well, we're reading the Bible, and it says something different. In fact, we're going to dissect the Bible a little bit and take it apart because this doesn't belong in there. That's not really true. So the early church is saying, no, we know this is true because that was handed down to us by the apostles. Here's what they taught. Um, salvation, fidelity, and the proclamation of the true gospel. Uh, the true gospel. Um, and we see in scriptures where there's attention called to something that's not the true gospel. Well, we see that in the book of Galatians, right? Uh, we see warnings about that in John's letters, right? Uh, but the, uh, the Antichrist. So salvation, fidelity, and the proclamation of the gospel. And then seminal doctrines, I need to keep an S. So seminal, the essential doctrines of the Christian faith. Fidelity to the essential truths of the Christian faith. And we're going to look at a few of those throughout this course. I'll introduce those in just a minute. But that was, was going on from the time when the apostles left all the way to the present day. Our pastors label, labor hard to make sure that our, that our doctrines are taught truly. And Jason even said it, said it Sunday, he's not afraid to get into passages that are, that are hard to teach because it's important that we know the whole counsel of God. And so teaching the truths of the scripture, what are the things that essentially distinguish a true Christian church? Every historical period has faced the same things that we face now. Every period in history, every generation, there's the presence of false teachings. There were false teachings back in that Paul was warning about, false teachings in the early church, false teachings today, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, Right? There, there are people that will call themselves Christian, but they're not true in what they say about God and about the gospel. Um, there's other religions and other belief systems. Um, even people will say, I don't believe in anything. I don't believe there is a God. There's internal struggles. Sometimes the church wrestles. Um, and that's happened throughout history as well, where people disagree over things in the church. Um, sometimes minor things, sometimes major things. Um, 1024, the church split into east and west. The one church finally got to the point where they said, we're splitting. We're, we're coming apart. And that happened. Um, well, there were a number of things. Some of it was... Some of it was power and land, <laughs> some of it was theological. So a number of things that, that happened. And we'll, we'll talk some about that. Uh, today, what troubles me is, and um, if I go on uh, social media, you know, I see evangelicals kind of yelling at each other. And it's really sad to see that because guess what? The public can see that. The world can see that. Um, and... It's just sad to see those things happening when our goal is, should be focused on the gospel, not on knocking on, you know, knocking against someone who's been entrusted with the gospel for their church. If I'm not there and part of what they're doing, I really don't know them to know what's going on. I shouldn't be beating up on them for that, right? It's really sad to, to see that. <laughs> We used to get into some pretty good discussion. Uh, we have two totally different views of the book of Revelation. <laughs> but we agree to disagree. Rather than get into knockdown, drag out fights over it and, and holler and carry on about it, we have two very different versions of it. So Yeah. But Christ still comes Christ still comes back, right? <laughs> Christ still comes back, right? right. <laughs> that, well, that's basically what I told him. Bottom line is Christ is coming again. That's just <laughs> It's okay to have convictions about things in Scripture that aren't clear as long as you don't border into something that's untrue, right? Cultural influences um, in the church, again, that's been around the entire history of the church. Things that can 
it could, that can influence uh, what people think or believe and can cause difficulty. Paul writes about, uh, about eating and says, um, uh, you know, be careful not to say you should eat this or that and warns about, um, he says, I even have stopped eating meat in certain places because people would go and get meat uh, near temples that were worshiping idols. Um, and people think, is that okay to do? I feel bad about that. So Paul was saying, I'm, I'm going to stay away from it so I don't, I don't cause my brother to stumble if they're convicted that that's wrong. Right? So, but Paul would say, there's no, there's no, there's, those gods aren't real. I can go eat that meat. I only believe in the one true God. But because it troubles my brother, and that's a cultural, cultural thing, right? Church versus state. Uh, there have been periods where the church thrives in the state, and there's periods where the church and the state differ because uh, you can't regulate morality. <laughs> you can do the opposite. So every historical period has faced these things, and yet the one thing that's consistent are the essential truths. Um, and uh, so what do you think are some of the challenges that we face today along these lines? What do you worry about when you think about um, the world and the church, this church in this world, in this place? What about softening of the, the message to make it more palatable to the Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of folks don't believe that there is truth. So you can't have the conversation of you need to know the truth to pass it on because truth is relative, but it's not. Yeah. There is no absolute truth, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. There is, but there is. They don't have so, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think one of the things that I'm seeing is in so many churches the fear of man. You know, the Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs, sure. the fear of man proves to be a snare. The fear of man when it comes to saying the truth yeah. about what God's word says. Yeah. And being fearful that you're going to get yeah. attacked, which you will, because Jesus said you would. You yeah. have trials and tribulations. The so I think the, the fear, the fear of people not, not, you know, you don't have to be so mean about it, but you can just tell the truth, and then that's up to them. You don't have to have a debate with them, and I think there's just so many people that are afraid to just tell the truth. Yeah. Mary, I do think I have a concern about this heritage being passed to the next generation. I, I worry that, um, that it's being dropped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's um, um, when I started in seminary, and I had no idea I was going to go into, you know, vocational ministry at all. We went, it was just wouldn't it be great to get this training and go help somebody in church somewhere? Um, but um, along the way, one of my convictions became: I want to be able to teach this in the church, not just teach it in classes, but teach this in the church, because I see the you know the importance of being able to know the truths of our essential face, know the true gospel, be able to th think about it and know how to pass it on. Um, Chris Campbell is here. His passion now is discipleship. I mean, he wants to see others grow in their faith in Christ. Um, so we've had some good conversations about that. I'm, I'm encouraged by his conviction. Um, but yeah, this is, this is important. Right. I think we're somewhat uniquely positioned here. We have a an older generation of Bernieites that have been, you know, nourished and, and fed God's word. Yeah. We've got a younger pastor now that's going to bring in the next generation of people because churches tend to skew towards the age of their pastor. Yep. And yep. so we've got yep. this older generation that can pour into the next generation. And so yeah. I'm excited to be a part of that. You know. Yeah. So. Yep. And, 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 also, in that same token, be able to raise a family in that. Yes, you know, absolutely. That's, that's yeah. you know, having been raised in a church, I think that that's, you know, it's, you get to see that passing yeah. on. Yeah. The faith. Yeah. It's, you think back, look at how many times, how many generations.
generations. Yeah. It's been passed to get to each and every one of us. So it's yeah. just good to be able to continue to raise them children up yeah. in that where you know that they're secure. One thing I love about Teresa Moen is, uh, I hear her say this quite often, we got to we got to teach them about Jesus. <laughs> she really cares about that, which is everything in the Bible points back to everything points to Jesus. Yeah. So. Yep. Yep. All right. So I want to I want to take you through a really short trip through history. Right. Just hit on a couple of people. Uh, this is Irenaeus. Irenaeus was towards the end of the second century, and uh, he wrote. Uh, he was he was a uh, 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 bishop in Lyon, so in France. Um, and uh, he wrote against a heresy called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics believed that, the easiest way to say it is, is matter bad, physical bad, spirit good. And so it doesn't matter what you do in this life. What you really need is the secret knowledge of the spiritual. And out of that came a denial that uh, for some that Jesus actually became man because, well, God could not take on him. That's, that would pollute his deity. Um, a, a ripping up of the Bible, as I said about this can be in there, that can't be. A denial that God created. It was a, it was a um, inferior creator that made it. That's why it was made bad. All those things. So, he wrote extensively trying to refute that teaching because he saw people very tempted to flee off to that in some were. And he cared about the church. But this is what he said, and this is amazing. Because think about the fact that, you know, you don't have the internet, you don't have telephone, you don't have uh, easy ways for people to know things. But he said this about the church, the true church, back in, uh, in 180. As I have already observed, the church, having received this preaching and this faith, although scattered throughout the whole world, Yet, as if occupying but one house, carefully preserves it. So he said the true church is preaching the truth, the scriptures, the truth about God and the gospel, no matter where you go. And they're carefully preserving it. There was attention being paid uh, by those who were leading churches to ensure that the truth of scripture is being taught. Well, he was just a couple of generations down from John because Irenaeus could say, and he wrote this, I learned from Polycarp. And Polycarp learned from John the Apostle. So John wrote about the Antichrist. He wrote about incipient Gnosticism. So Irenaeus had his ear on what was going on in the world because he had learned that. And he could confess against the Gnostics, and to the church, listen carefully. We are teaching the true. We're, we're, we're following the rule of faith, the rule of truth. That which the apostles taught. We're preserving that, what was handed down to us. And so he was serious about what was going on in the world around him and what was affecting believers in the church. The Catholic, that means universal, not Roman Catholic, right? The, the universal church possesses one and the same faith throughout the whole world. He made that, he made that claim, that boast, with also some great hope that that was true and that that was going to be preserved after he was gone. He cared about that. I'm sure we're passing down truth versus tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, he was anchored in truth. Um, when we look at uh, when we look at the Trinity, we're going to do that um, in a couple of weeks. Um, he be, he he began that conversation pretty seriously in how he defined how we should look at our faith. He started with um, three principles: God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So tradition happened and became competitive in a way, in a certain way, that was considered to be on par, but we'll get there. Yeah. How did he roam around and talk to people? How did he know that, like, was just he a traveling theologian and he would talk to well, He was anchored in, but he knew it because he saw it. Okay. And he studied it. 
In fact, when he wrote against the heresies, against the Gnostics, he describes like 30 different flavors of it. So he really had studied it carefully to be able to articulate to the church why this was false. And one of them was because, hey, there's all these different variations. Which one are you going to believe? This one says this. This one says that. This one. So, but that's all new and novel. Let's go back to what's always been true. Right. Okay. Uh, 250 years later, I said 350. I didn't correct this, but 250 years later, here's Vincent of Larens. Larens is on uh, was in on an island near uh, France or in that territory. But this is 434, so later, and. So we've gone through periods of lots of refutation against false teachings. We've gotten through the Nicene Creed. We've gotten through the Creed of Chalcedon. And here's Vincent Laren saying this, because there's still some struggles going on in the church. They're wrestling over certain ideas. And he says this, very similar to what Irenaeus was saying. We take the greatest care to hold that which has been believed everywhere and by all. So those essential truths that we've held from Scripture, we are care- being very careful to, to hold to those. So in conversations, bringing those up. But, 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 this is what we've always believed to address things that were coming up. Well, I think Christ was really like, but. Um, and then I want to take you all the way to Reformation. Um, oh, I didn't make a slide out of that, but I've got John Calvin on here. Let me just find my notes real quick. This is going to be really good on a recording. John Calvin. So this is 1559, his Institutes. Um, that's his Institutes of the Christian Religion, and it's amazing. It's incredibly long to read, but it's pretty amazing, the work he did. Um but he said this. So he was a pastor of Geneva. He was a key leader of the, of the Reformation, uh, trying to recoil back from what had happened to the Roman church. Um, and he wrote this. Wherever we see the word of God purely preached and heard and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution, that was purposeful because they're reclaiming the truth about baptism and the Lord's Supper. There is, not to be doubted, a church of God exists. So the the pastors should be preaching the word of God truly, the true word of God, the the truth about the word of God, and administering the sacraments. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, great meaning and purpose in those sacraments. We'll talk about that some later. So you've got this thread going all the way through that you see over and over again. What has the church always believed? What are the essential truths of the faith that we need to care for and then pass along? None of them knowing, none of these men knowing whether or not they'd be even remembered. I mean, they were dealing with their own time. They weren't trusting for their own time, but they were also handing off to the ones after them. Alexander in, in, uh, in Alexandria, Egypt, passed on to Athanasius, who carried on after him. I know a lot about him because that was work I did. Anyway, um, but so they're thinking about the next generation just like we are. But even now, we can go back and, and read them and go, yeah, that's really true. Yeah, that's really true. We might say it differently, but it's the same truth being passed down. And they cared about that just as we should care about that in our church for our day and with the children that we're raising up in the church. When we do that child dedication and we commit ourselves as a church, we need to take that really seriously. Um, Karen and I were very blessed because um, with our kids, so Karen prayed about that early, but there were people in our church that tapped on them and said, hey, I'll disciple you. Um, Women for our daughter and then some men for our son. Um, and cared about them. And we said, you know, those people believe what we believe. This is a good thing. (laughs) They're taking that interest in them and caring about them. The greatest care told that which has been believed everywhere and by all. So what happens is, um, and 
be glad that this happens is that some in the church actually will do this. They'll look up, they're gonna, they're gonna pay attention to scriptures and they're gonna, they're gonna pray as they read scriptures and, and, and listen for uh, God's help and take instruction in the scriptures by the Holy Spirit. They'll look up, they'll look around to see what's going on in the world around them. Is there anything that's happening that's not quite right, that's influencing our church? Are people getting distracted by that and it's not quite true? Or what's going on in the culture around us that we need to be aware of and prepare ourselves to be able to, to teach about? And then they'll look back. They'll go back and, and see what was said before. They'll go back to the riches of history through, through places before and they'll study and they'll say, yes, this is what the church has always believed. Oh, this was how something was addressed in that time. We are carrying on the tradition faithfully. So that, uh, that picture, that's just a random guy on the end. That's John Calvin and there's, uh, there's John and there's, I mean, oh no, that's Paul and that's John. So John looking out on the island of Patmos as he's seeing, I guess, the, that, in that picture, it's him seeing the revelation that's being you know, unfolded to him. This is the idea there. But uh, so we go, what was believed then about this, some doctrine? What was believed then about the Lord's Supper? And what's believed now? Right? You can go back and study and understand, has this been true always that way? And if it hasn't, what influenced that change? What influenced development of doctrine? It wasn't that those things aren't true from Scripture. It's just how to express them uh, became important as, as false teachings came up. Oh, we need to make sure we say this to close that loophole because this is what's true in Scripture, but we need to say, exclude that which is not true in Scripture, right? And what about doctrinal change? Because sometimes doctrines change, and that's not always a good thing if, if it's bringing in a, a, a false belief, right? Jesus is just a good man. Jesus is a good teacher, um, but not the Savior, not the Son of God. Hmm? Mm, yeah. Same Bible then and now. So we're reading the same Bible. Uh, so how do we get to where we are today with our teaching of it? So we're going to explore some of that. Here's what we're going to do. Here's where we're going. How am I doing on time? I've just got a few minutes left. Okay. Uh, we're going to look at the essential truths of the Christian faith. So here's the ones we're going we're to go through, right? And not necessarily as directly as they're laid out, but I'll show you kind of the pattern for what our, what our course is going to be about. One, the Bible, the authority and sufficiency of the scriptures. We're going to talk about that. And I'll paint this picture of the grand narrative uh, to show you the, the big picture of the Bible and how to, how to approach reading it from that perspective. The Trinity, one God in three persons, each person fully God, one God in three persons. So we'll, we'll talk about that because uh, I'm going to kind of package the course a bit around God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You'll see that in a minute. Jesus Christ is God the Son. He's fully and truly God, fully and truly human. So, yeah, that's an essential truth. And I'll hopefully show you why it's important. And not just, oh, yeah, it's, okay, I know that. But why it's important for us to believe that in our faith. The fall, the spiritual lostness of the human race. Um, uh, if we forget that, then the gospel becomes less important and urgent. Um, and it can also be difficult to have conversations with people who say, well, I'm basically a good person. Um, or, well, when I clean myself up, I'll come to God, things like that. So, no, 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 it's a serious thing that, um, that we're born in sin and that we're sinners. And to know that, and also know what that means for our, our lives in Christ as new creatures. Now, we still, we still have this body of sin. And salvation, the gospel, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, Right? So those are, uh, those are the five that we're going to focus on as we go through these, these next several weeks. Make sure that we understand that 
it's important for our church to hold to these, to understand them better and better, uh, to, uh, uh, to be prepared, to teach them, um, to listen for good instruction, and to be able to teach them in our homes to our children that they know these things are true. On this last one, so I had an interesting experience just recently. Um, father was about to meet uh, somebody who's going to become his future son-in-law, and uh, you know, just wanted to talk about the conversation that they were going to have because he thought that maybe his future son-in-law had a works-based idea of salvation. And uh, as we talked about, I said, um, I said uh, that um, the more you look at what Christ did on the cross, the more you grow closer to understanding what Christ did on the cross, how can you possibly think there's anything that you contributed to your salvation through how you live, what you do, right? And the scriptures affirm that over and over and over again. So those are the five. And then we're gonna look at the marks of the true church. So what is a true church? Um, what does a true church of Jesus Christ exhibit that shows you, yes, we are a true church? And Supper. what's that? Wednesday night suppers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, <Freedom>. and nobody <laughs> perfectly with these things, but I think these are really important. And I've got several of them. Oriented to the glory of God. Recharge. He talked about the name of God. And I, I, I'd been, when I, when I developed this, I was thinking about how the Israelites were, the, the, northern, or the southern kingdom was exiled because they had profaned God's name. And he's going to restore his name. Oriented to the glory of God. Bringing him glory when we're gathered together. Bringing him glory when we're not together. Um, that made in the image of God more and more through the work of the Spirit and through our attention to scriptures, we should desire that our lives bring God glory and that our church brings God glory. So that's one, that we're, we're uh, serious about that in uh, what's preached and what's sung and what we learn and what we're taught and how we live. Um, Jason and the other you know, preaching pastors are very intentional about ensuring that there's a walk away with something from the message that matters. Um, focused on the Word of God, the Word of God being, you know, Christ, the Word of God, but also the Scriptures. So we're going to talk about that. That central to uh, central is is Christ, and from that the gospel, and central is that we that we uh, do preach the word, teach the word, read the word, and grow in our understanding of the word. Grow to maturity, as Paul wrote about in Ephesians. Convicted, because the Spirit was sent to convict us of truth, righteousness, and judgment. That's, how, that's part of the, how the work goes to bring, bring people to faith in Christ. Gathered, gifted, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to spend some time on the Holy Spirit and talk about Him in relationship to the, to the church. Gathered as members in a covenant relationship with God, it's not an accident that we are here as a church. Um, but understanding what that means to be in a local church um, and a committed relationship to one another. So Scripture talks about that over and over and over again. Old Testament and New. United by a personal confession of faith in Christ. Everybody has their own uh, account of how they came to faith in Christ even though that's a mysterious act of God that, that, that goes on that probably we'll never be able to really understand what happened, but we just, some of us can know the moment that it happened. Uh, but a personal confession and a common confession of the biblical and historic Christian faith of these essentials, that we agree on what we confess about who God is, we agree on what we confess about the Bible, that we agree on what we confess about the, the gospel, and then called to proclaim the gospel and advance the kingdom of God. And then finally, we are assembled as a historic reality. We are a church. We're a real live church right here. We're a historical reality uh, in God's plan. 
And each local church, and so that means First Baptist Bernie, in its place and time, so God planted us 120-something years ago. We're still here today. And in this time, day and time, we are serious about exercising stewardship. As Paul told Timothy, as Irenaeus said, as Vincent of Lawrence said, as Calvin said, all these marks in the here and now. So that others are drawn here. So that those who are here grow to maturity and go out. Um, so that we bring glory to God when we meet. So here's our outline. I'll go through this fairly quickly because I want to leave a little space for the last, last piece. Or, so, Sadie, I promise I'm going to put cookies on the lower shelf. I promise. Uh, that, that was my one, uh, my really one stab at it. So here we go. Outline. So, so next week, we're going to talk about, and the, each of these will be entrusted, entrusted with until we get to the last week. We are entrusted with, as Paul entrusted Timothy, we're entrusted with the essential truths of the Christian faith. So those five. So we're going to walk through those five a little bit more deeply next week. We're going to be going through them even more so as we continue on. But I want to give you just some context for each one of them. Those five essential truths and why they matter. Then we'll turn to God and God the Father. So the church, the Christian, and God the Father. A few weeks there, we're going to be entrusted with a confession of the one true God. That we confess the one true God. One God in three persons. Entrusted with the scriptures, and we'll talk about the grand narrative. Um, it's a Trinitarian creation, redemption narrative. Um, and with this, its center being Christ. Then we'll talk about entrusted to worship and glorify God the Father. Um, Jason mentioned about how Jesus talked about that uh, in the walk to the cross. His prayer in John 17, where he says, I've done everything that you've asked me to do. I brought you glory in it. So um, John 1, he mentions that we see God through the Son who revealed him. So we want to know how do we, in our walk, worship and glorify God the Father. So we'll talk about that. The church, the believer, and God the Son, Jesus Christ... So we'll turn to the Son, entrusted to know, follow, and proclaim our Savior and Lord, God the Son, Jesus Christ. Entrusted with the gospel. We'll do two weeks on that. Entrusted with awareness of gospel living in our time. How do we live the gospel in our daily lives? And then entrusted with a message of hope that Christ is, is going to return. We know that that's, that's true because he promised it. And finally, the church, the Christian, the Holy Spirit, entrusted to know and trust our counselor and sanctifier, God, the Holy Spirit. And that feeds into the church, what the church is, because uh, he was sent after Christ ascended to um, help and develop and guide and plant and all that for the church. So we're entrusted to be a faithful, healthy, and maturing church. What does that look like? Entrusted to be faithful in the flock. But each of us is faithful in the flock as members planted here in this local church that the Holy Spirit planted in Bernie, Texas. And then trust to be faithful to the flock. That's how we are faithful to one another. And then finally, a summary and kind of next steps. I'll be doing this along the way because I'm going to try and make sure every week that I give you those practical implications of what we're talking about. Um, and draw, or, or draw those out. But at the end, I'm going to say, hey, the passing of baton, what is your calling? No matter what the Lord's calling you to do in this church and outside this church, it's a calling he's given you, entrusted with these truths of the faith, to be faithful. So I want to kind of, that'll be kind of like the, the, the landing of the flip across the, the vault. Make sense? All right. So finally, and here you go. What does it look like? And I want to give you a family story from Scripture. Don't know too much about what happened in the family, but we know this, right? 
that uh, we are trusted with the living truths, the living truths of the Christian faith. And here it is. So we're going back, we're going to 2 Timothy, the next letter on. And here's what Paul said, um, as he's encouraging Timothy. Um, For I am mindful, he's reminding Timothy to continue to be faithful, continue to do what he's doing. He's going to take this letter, but, but he says this, it's beautiful. For I am mindful of the sincere faith Now, Paul uses that sincere faith a couple of times in his letters to Timothy. So Timothy has a sincere faith that he encourages him to to continue to have. But the sincere means unfeigned, not pretending, undisguised, not just showing up and looking like you're faithful, but not really, right? Sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice. So Paul says, they had, your grandmother had a sincere faith. Your mother had a sincere faith. And I'm sure that's in you as well. So something happened in that home that Lois was a true believer in God. And probably through Paul's visits or some. What else came to know Christ? I think that's what Paul means by this. And Lois and Eunice, the same. They had a a sincere faith. Paul wouldn't say that about someone unless he knew that were true or believed that were true. We don't know anything else about Lois or Eunice. They don't come up again in, in the Bible, but we can see this. The true faith was in both mother and daughter. So Eunice and her daughter Lois, or Lois and her daughter Eunice. Yeah. True belief in the true God, and we can expect that they received and believed the gospel, or else believed in the promises of God if they hadn't heard the gospel. Because I don't know how old Eunice was, but or Lois was, but I assume Paul probably met her. And Timothy was the grandson of Lois and the son of of Eunice, a way in which the baton was passed in his home was seeing the true faith of his mother and his grandmother, perhaps in knowledge, perhaps in practice. Isn't that amazing? I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. I did not grow up in a Christian home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You're talking about a grandmother mother. I did not have that. Yeah. So I don't have that legacy of Christian faith really. Yeah. What do you say about that? I would say for those who didn't grow up in a Christian home but they're Christians, they're starting a legacy. Yeah, right? Sure. Now there's no guarantee that your children will come to faith in Christ. You can't, you can't guarantee that. Only, only the Lord knows that. But you also carry on someone else's legacy. Somebody led you to Christ. Yeah, that's true too. Yep. That's true too. Yeah. But I trust, I mean, of course, I guess back then they lived on farms and it was hard and life was terrible. Yeah. a bunch of things, but yeah. they did not have the background for this. But I came to know Christ, mm-hmm. but it wasn't through seeing it lived in in the home. Yeah. But then because of that, I think you realize it's more important for your family to get it from you than than you got yeah. not getting it from your family. Yeah. I think it's more so important. there are a lot of people like that yeah. that yeah. we need to address because it's uh, not necessarily yeah. not necessarily. Well yeah. Lois obviously had to have gotten it from somewhere. Just like <coughs> you're getting it from somewhere. Mm-hmm. So she started that. Mm-hmm. Passing it down. Passing it down. Yeah. I've often considered the fact that so many people get excited about genealogies and who their grandparents were and great-grandparents and what kind of heritage they have, but 
the greatest genealogy is, is who led you to Christ? Yeah. And who led them to Christ? And who led them to Christ? So and we won't know that until we get to heaven. So much more important. It's so much more important. Because, you know, what my great-grandpa was, I might not have been too proud of that. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> At least not now. Whenever I was a heathen, I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> and I think some of the stewardship, too, it might not even be leading them to Christ, but I know I spend all day with a lot of lost people, and there's lots of opportunities to just share little nuggets, and they see how I interact with clients who are doing not appropriate things, and I won't do it. And so I like to, you know, I hope that. They're seeing that there's a difference, and I'm stewarding that truth. So if somebody else comes along and it's not me, that they at least have an idea of oh, there are Christians in the secular world where this you can live differently. So I get lots of questions. I think the point is it's not just your family that right. you're stewarding. No. The way you yeah. For everybody to see, absolutely. I, I yeah. I just wanted to share this because I thought this is. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. 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 I think I think what I noticed about this scripture is that sincere faith is revealed, and we don't really always know in what way God would choose to reveal it. But this is just one example mm -hmm. of how a sincere faith was revealed to other people, to Timothy is especially in, uh, in that he had this um, heritage. But when I look at that, what encourages me is just to know that sincere faith will be revealed. I don't know whose legacy I might start, whether it's my family, grandchildren, friends, my neighbor. I don't know. You know, but just knowledge yeah. that it is sincere faith. Yeah. Is yeah. And and uh, you know, kind of think. I know we got to wrap up, um, but uh, kind of think bigger picture. We're thinking, yeah, definitely about each one of us, but bigger picture is the church that we are stewarding as a church. We are stewarding. So that's as simple as um, you know, praying for um, your you know your pastors as they as they preach. Praying for your growth group leaders as they teach, you know. Praying that um, um, that we will um, together, you know, grow in our faith. Pray for the one another's. Pray for how we how we uh, you know care for one another in fellowship together. Um, people notice those things when they're different. Um, I think about after Pentecost and Peter's sermon. So they're drawing people all the time. People have been going to the temple. But what are they doing? They're, they're listening to the apostles' teaching. They're breaking bread together. They're sharing with anyone who has anything in need. So the, the Holy Spirit's transforming them in a way that other Jews that, are look, that have been going to the temple are looking at them and going, what in the world's going on there with those people? By how they are serious about sitting under that teaching and, and praying together and giving away things to other people because they need it. You know, so amazing testimony just to live it out together as a community. Anyway, thanks for coming tonight. Hope to see you next week. Let me pray for you and then uh, go ahead out. Father, thank you for this group that you brought here tonight. Um, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us to continue as a church, First Baptist Church, Bernie to be faithful stewards of what you've entrusted us with. Um, this is your son's church, it's not ours. But you've put us here. Um, and Lord, uh, we're grateful for that. We're grateful for the fellowship that we have. Grateful for the, the truth in, in preaching and teaching that we hear and see. But Lord, if there's anything that you would need to correct, please show that to us as well. Help us to be faithful. Lord, we are uh, humbled humbled that almost 2,000 years later, here we are carrying that same baton for the purposes that you have in mind for us, the people that you desire to bring here, for how the gospel is going to go forth here. We don't know that. 
Um, but just help us to be faithful. Pray that in Christ's name. Amen.